Okay, as usual, good morning, everybody. Hope everybody's having a good start to their day. Uh, thank you for joining us. And of course, as usual, we always give it about a minute or so to get everybody to join us here on our webinar. We have a lot of, a lot of great stuff to update on and uh, particularly some really great presentations coming um, with us today. So thanks for everybody for joining us. Uh, before we get started with our usual daily updates, uh, of course, we'll send out CME link to you as usual, but I wanna turn over Dr. Harrington. We're gonna share a couple links with you and Dr. Harrington wants to briefly talk about yeah, thanks, Errol, and thanks to both our speakers today as well as our panelists, particularly our panelists who have been with us here week after week. And thanks to the audience for continuing to, uh, to join Medical Grand Rounds. We're going to try to continue to uh, make it a service that's, uh, that's most valuable to the Stanford community and, uh, and beyond. Um, many of you were uh, online, I suspect, several weeks ago when we talked about the Department of Medicine's commitment to social and racial justice uh, in the wake of... Uh, uh, of brutal murders of, uh, of, of George Floyd. And so we wanted to make you aware of two recent publications involving uh, members of our faculty, members of our faculty leadership group. The first is a piece both about and by Eldrin Lewis, our, uh, our chief of cardiovascular medicine that appeared on Medscape and then has been uh, repeated in uh, Stanford publications. And, this, and, and it's on being a black physician. And uh, it's a very powerful story, and I'd, uh, I'd recommend highly that you read it. The second is a piece just published last week by Yuri Lottebaum. Yuri is our clinical chief of, uh, of gastroenterology and a, a longtime Stanford faculty member. Yuri published in the Annals of Internal Medicine under the category of On Being a Doctor. His reflections of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, told from his unique position as, a, uh, as someone who immigrated to the United States from Mexico at age 12. Uh, both pieces, I think, are quite powerful. Both pieces are um, quite poignant. And uh, I would advise people to or recommend to people that you take a look at these. Errol's going to send out a link to them so that you can have easy access. With that, Errol, thank you. Uh, thank you to our panelists and speakers again. Let me turn it back to Errol. Thank you, Dr. Harrington. I uh, appreciate that. And those are really great articles. So please do take a look at them. Uh, and then we'll turn over for our weekly updates. Dr. Huja, thanks as always for providing updates every week. Thank you and good morning, everyone. So uh, this morning we have 21 COVID patients in the hospital, six are in the ICU. And I think that's a nice reflection of the trend that we're seeing both around the country and in the Bay Area where the numbers are fortunately finally starting to plateau and decrease. If you remember, we hit a record high on Friday, the 24th of July with 41 COVID patients and a record high in our ICU of 15 patients. So we have fortunately passed that peak and hopefully will continue to plateau or decrease. However, clinically, the medicine wards remain busy. The ICU also remains busy. And when that happens, the consulting services like nephrology and ID are also busy. I'll describe the other inpatient Department of Medicine services as stable busy, so manageable volumes, but definitely back to some of the pre-COVID times. Looking at our numbers for COVID admissions uh, from March 1st to August 1st, our ICU rates still remain at 20%. And as we know, um, you know, most of the ICU admissions, if they occur, it's usually transferred within 48 hours after admission to the floor. And the length of stay in the ICU is about three weeks. We've had 14 deaths, so still keeping with our death percentage rate at just under 5%. And females tend to comprise the majority of our inpatient population. And as we saw last week, uh, you know, 20% of our females were pregnant. Looking at the age breakdown, it's still similar to what it has been. I think the initial peak of a little bit of more younger patients has started to also stabilize. And then finally, just I'm keeping the data brief since the updates are similar to last week, you can see that the ICU numbers are a little bit lower when you look at the percentage of total uh, COVID admissions. So that's a nice trend to see. And then in the Bay Area, we see that decline as well. Now, last week, there was a request for some of the pediatric data. So I have reached out to one of our pediatric colleagues Dr. Roshni Matthews, who will um, share some of the pediatric data with us. So thank you, Roshni, for being with us. She is a pediatric infectious disease physician who also uh, has some epidemiology in her background. So Roshni, I'll turn it over to you. 
Thank you so much, Nira, and thank you all for this opportunity. Um, I'm just going to share my slides. Um, can you see my slides okay? Yes. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to just present uh, the SARS-CoV-2 positive in patients at LPCH, but, uh, specifically the pediatric population. Um, as you know, we have maternity and LND under uh, LPCH as well. Um, I will not be presenting uh, the obstetric population, just the pediatric. Um, this is the distribution of patients uh, that have been positive at, at LPCH who are admitted for at least 24 hours. And as you can see, um, our numbers have slowly crept up. And in July, we had 19 patients. Um, and August so far till this morning, we've had two. Um, so uh, very different from adults though, um, as you will see shortly, uh, but this is the number of patients we have had in total, which is 30. Um, the age distribution um, we've had, the youngest we've had so far is six weeks of age um, and the oldest uh, 27 years old. Uh, the 27 year old is a patient with pediatric malignancy and has been followed at LPCH oncology. Uh, our older patients over 18 are primarily oncology patients, but you can see the distribution um, is primarily the one to nine years, and then we have uh, quite a bit of um, a teenage population as well. Um, this is a, a little bit about the demographics. As you can see, um, a, a huge majority, like 26 of our patients have been Latino uh, with Spanish uh, as their primary language, um, and uh, a fair split between male, male and females. I just wanted to show a little bit about the underlying health status of these patients. Um, when I say uh, previously healthy, so they do not have any other uh, underlying medical condition. They are previously healthy children. Um, other chronic medical conditions include patients with small bowel or type 1 diabetes. Um, and we have also had a renal transplant patient in that mix. Uh, cardiac conditions include patients who are on LVAD, awaiting heart transplant, or have had a heart transplant or pulmonary hypertension, um, or premature infants who have chronic pulmonary disease. So this is kind of the split of uh, underlying medical conditions. Um, I think this is a, an important distinction between pediatrics and adults. Uh, COVID is very different in pediatric population. Um, as you can see, 60% of our positives uh, are classified as asymptomatic. So they did not have any respiratory complaints or any symptoms of COVID. When they came in, they had an alternative diagnosis. Um, many of them had appendicitis. Um, uh, some of them had bacteremia, either a central line associated bloodstream infection or a late onset um, a sepsis that we see in the very young infants. Um, so they, um, and then there was a new oncology diagnosis. All of these had no COVID related symptoms. Uh, only four of our patients out of the 30, uh, I classified as moderate to severe because they had some level of supplemental oxygen requirement. Uh, we currently have seven pediatric patients that are inpatient, out of which two of them are mechanically ventilated. One, me one mechanically ventilated patient has a primary neurological condition that uh, places um, that patient in uh, chronic respiratory failure. There is only one patient who is mechanically ventilated that whose presentation is very akin to the adult COVID presentation and does have, um, is an older teen um, and has the obesity as um, the risk factor. We have not had a, uh, the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, the MISC uh, that is um, very well known at this time. Uh, we have not had one of those uh, presentations at LPCH. Um, so this is all I had to share. Dr. Matthew, thank you so much for sharing those updates. And, uh, and thanks for everybody for feedback. We've, we've definitely gotten the a word that the more is better and we're happy to help facilitate providing as much feedback and, and info of what's going on in the hospitals as possible. So thank you again, uh, Dr. Matthew, for being with us. And Dr. Chang is gonna provide some updates about from occupational health. 
Hi, good morning, everyone. Glad to be here. Uh, finally, some good news uh, from uh, Akel, uh, mirroring uh, the uh, community trend uh, of leveling off. Uh, as you can see, uh, after uh, five or six great weeks of steady climb, uh, we had the first last week uh, of uh, decline in uh, newly positive healthcare workers. Uh, that last data point is just from uh, one day of the week. Uh, but uh, it is indicative, uh, even at one point, that uh, 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 numbers are finally starting to come down. We had, uh, in the rolling week, we had 26 positives out of 1,400 tested for a 2% positivity rate, and that's down from a peak of 4% positive. And for symptomatic persons, we continue to see about 50 people a day with uh, potential symptoms, uh, and of those, only about 4% are positive. Again, that's down from our peak of 6%. Uh, and just to remind you, overall, uh, uh, we've tested about 19,000 employees uh, during this period, and about 1.7% uh, uh, have been positive, uh, which is about 335 people on our denominator of, of 20,000 uh, healthcare workers. Uh, the trends and the identified risk factors for our positives in the past week continue to be uh, uh, largely continue to be the ones that uh, I've mentioned and have emphasized. Uh, household, known household positives continue to be the single largest source of uh, newly positive healthcare workers. Uh, as you uh, may recall now, we've instituted uh, a policy um, reflecting uh, national recommendations that uh, anyone with a positive household uh, uh, member stay home uh, and and quarantine for 14 days after the last contact. Uh, and so this should dramatically reduce the number of uh, positive healthcare workers uh, from that source. Social gatherings continue to be uh, an emerging uh, source of new infections. Uh, uh, family gatherings, picnics, uh, and so forth, reflecting uh, summer and, and uh, the desire to uh, see family and friends. So please, I would urge everyone to uh, really be thoughtful and careful uh, if and when you do engage in socially distanced uh, social gathering. Um, the good news is that we had no workplace worker to work, uh, healthcare worker to healthcare worker transmission in the last week uh, in the hospital setting. We had one in uh, the School of Medicine uh, in the engineering uh, uh, arena, but none uh, in the hospital uh, uh, or clinic. So uh, thank you, everyone, that, you know, this is a, a big change and uh, I think an accomplishment uh, due to everyone's uh, increased diligence in terms of social distancing, especially around the issue of lunch and small break rooms and the impossibility of uh, really uh, distancing physically uh, and not wearing, and wearing masks at the same time. So. Uh, I think uh, our uh, experience and our learning from it and, and what everybody's been doing has made a really big difference. So, so thank you uh, for your efforts uh, in that arena. We do have one new risk factor that's emerging this week, uh, and that is uh, from uh, uh, positive patients. Uh, thanks to Ben Pinsky, who's on our panel this morning as well. Uh, uh, the lab did some forensics uh, in a, a small cluster we had in one of our units, and uh, it turned out that the patient had come in uh, originally negative, but very quickly uh, uh, had turned uh, positive, uh, and, uh, uh, and we unknowingly um, uh, continued to care for them as if they were COVID negative. Uh, patient received some aerosol generating uh, procedures uh, along the way, uh, and uh, as a result, uh, we had a small cluster outbreak. So uh, our clinical leadership are considering a variety of mitigating uh, uh, strategies uh, uh, around clinical policy, uh, possibly, and just a, a variety of things that they're considering treating uh, all patients with aerosol generating procedures as if they were uh, PUIs, uh, automatically adding uh, a COVID uh, test to uh, any viral uh, respiratory panels, a, a variety of things. N none of these are set in stone, but the organization is responding uh, with uh, uh, appropriate mitigation strategies for this. Uh, for, for the clinicians in the room, 
uh, if a patient deteriorates or develops new pulmonary symptoms, please uh, consider and rule out COVID and treat them as a PUI, uh, even if they had a relatively recent uh, negative um, uh, COVID test. I think that uh, that would be the prudent thing to do uh, in this era. So that's, uh, that's my report for today. Thank you. Dr. Cheng, thank you so much. We'll get into now uh, our upcoming presentations. I first want to just briefly mention that next week we have uh, Dr. Martin Landry, who will be covering, uh, talking about the recovery trials. I think many of you have heard of. So uh, today, though, we have a couple of really great uh, presenters with us. And uh, we have Dr. Uh, first off, Dr. Cheryl Ho. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Wendy Caceres for connecting uh, me with Dr. Ho. Um, when we first learned that uh, that COVID would indeed be not something that is the great uh, equalizer of all people, but in fact, uh, increase the divide between uh, those that have and those of the disenfranchised. One name that continued to be coming out uh, was Dr. Cheryl Ho. And I'm really glad that uh, Wendy connected us because uh, as we've heard more and more issues uh, going on with COVID uh, for the disenfranchised, both from surveys and from questions throughout Grand Rounds over the last weeks and months, uh, people have requested Dr. Ho to come give a presentation. Dr. Ho really speaks to the level of respect and um, acknowledgement for what you've done uh, in this community. Uh, briefly, Dr. Ho graduated from UCSD um, in medical school in 2000. She did Santa Clara Valley Medical Residency uh, for her internal medicine. Um, she continues to be affiliated with Santa Clara County and also has a Stanford academic appointment as a clinical assistant professor in medicine in the Division of Primary Care and Population Health. She's boarded internal medicine and addiction medicine, and she's no surprise won uh, various awards. One example I saw online here was she was the clinician of the year for the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved, and uh, certainly has done um, a, 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 num a large amount of work for the people who need it the most. So Dr. Ho, thank you for being with us. Dr. Ho connected us with uh, Dr. Joshua uh, Bomberger, who will also be presenting with us today. He's an adjunct professor at UCSF in family community medicine. He actually graduated from NYMC in 89, came to UCSF for residency in 1992 and did his master's of public health and preventive health at UC Berkeley in 96. He's been at the department, the SF Department of Public Health for 28 years. He's ha held multiple, I, I just don't have time to go over all the, the things that he's done because it's, it's so much, but he is certainly qualified to talk about housing, uh, COVID, and, and really the, dealing with the, the underserved and the, the homeless. He's been, he's currently the senior physician specialist for the, for the uh, uh, Department of Public Health. And again, he's uh, done multiple, multiple, been involved in multiple, multiple initiatives and leadership positions. He's also currently a family physician for the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs in San Francisco as well. So Dr. Bomberger and Dr. Ho, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, Cheryl, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Ho, and let you present, share your slides, and um, we'll try to make time for questions at the end. Thanks so much. Stop sharing here. Okay, you can go ahead and share your slides. All right, so I'm going to talk today about, as um, thanks, Errol, for this privilege to be on here with you all today, about the San Francisco Bay Area experience of uh, folks experiencing homelessness in this COVID-19 era. Um, so, you know, for folks like myself who've been in homeless health care for a number of years, one of our party slogans, so to speak, is this fundamental concept of housing as health care. Uh, and we know from a number of mortality studies that the average age of death for a homeless person in the United States is approximately 50 years of age. And this is for both men and women. And it's clearly a 30 year lower life expectancy than the average American. Um, and so for us in homeless healthcare, more than any other medication or specific uh, procedure or healthcare intervention is that the provision of housing is literally a life and death intervention. So every two years, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, which is also known as HUD, uh, requires that communities across the country conduct a comprehensive count of all sheltered and unsheltered individuals uh, in the last 10 days of January. Uh, in Santa Clara County, our last uh, point in time homeless count was in 2019. And for those who might be new to the area, Santa Clara County is the catchment area that includes as far north, uh, Palo Alto, where Stanford's at, um, and as far south as the farming communities in Gilroy and all the cities in between, including Santa Clara County's largest city, San Jose. Uh, so in 2019, our uh, point in time homeless count uh, uh, was uh, surprisingly at uh, 
approximately 9,700 individuals. Um, and this is in contrast uh, to the prior decade where that number had been sitting pretty steadily at the 7,000s. Uh, we could go into an entire, um, another grand rounds about why those reasons are. Uh, but as you are all likely aware, homelessness is not an isolated economic issue, but it's profoundly at its most basic, the outcome of deep structural racism and inequalities. And we can see as, um, you know, from this uh, slide here uh, that uh, people that are black, brown and, indig and, and from indigenous communities are disproportionately represented uh, in the homeless population compared to the general population. And so when the beginning of the pandemic came to light in February and March, all of us who work with individuals experiencing homelessness became really nervous uh, because we knew that we were sitting on a tinderbox of potentially devastating consequences. Um, it's sort of akin to the early cruise ships where, you know, we were watching folks that were sitting in, uh, you know, under the same roof, sharing the same HVAC system. And we, um, you know, we're just watching kind of things happen before our eyes. And we knew that our patients also suffer from uh, disproportionate amounts of medical conditions as well as psychiatric conditions, which would put them at a higher risk for COVID as well as its complications. Um, and so I have actually this distinct memory of uh, Monday, March 16th, as I'm sure many of you do, the way that we all remember 9-11. Um, so historically on Monday nights, I provide clinical care off uh, one of the medical mobile units in the county, actually at a, uh, you know, actually at a Sunnyvale shelter. And so our medical mobile unit, which is a souped up uh, kind of RV on wheels that has two clinic rooms uh, on the sides. Um, you know, I was there on a Monday night right as the um, shelter in place uh, order went into effect. And it was a strange weekend because before that we saw this strange human behaviors of people at Costco kind of taking all the flour and chicken and toilet paper off the shelves. And it, it was remarkable in that it was unremarkable um, for me that I it was actually just a regular primary care day where I was seeing folks for hypertension, low back pain. Uh, and it felt that kind of the community was unaware of this seismic shift that was about to happen in our country uh, and in our world. And so we had about two weeks of this eerie quietness and then the news first started to break in the, in the homeless communities, first in Seattle, uh, just as it was for the general population. Uh, the MMWR, uh, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, put an official publication out in May uh, that kind of went into detail about Seattle's first positive case, which was a resident of a homeless shelter and two related homeless shelters. Uh, the CDC eventually came out to test uh, the other shelters that were associated and eventually found a, uh, an attack rate of about 18% in residents of the shelter and 21% uh, in the residents. I, I mean, I'm sorry, in the staff members. Um, and then the news started to come in from other ho ho homeless healthcare communities across the country. Uh, Josh is going to share a little bit more about the San Francisco experience, but as we can see from the slide, um, you know, in different shelter communities in Seattle, Boston, and San Francisco, uh, the number of percent positive ranged anywhere from 17 to 66 percent in residents and anywhere from 70 to 30 percent uh, in staff members. Uh, but on the flip side, you know, you would also see in a different shelter network in Seattle as well as in Atlanta around the same time, asymptomatic testing uh, yielded positive test results of anywhere between one to five percent. You know, and so from these MMWR reports, one would assume that the status quo for homeless individuals uh, in the United States is one of rampant spread of COVID akin to what we're seeing in the nursing homes. But surprisingly, and Josh and I will cover this a little bit more in detail, um, it's not been the, entirely the, the full picture of what's really been happening in, in these communities. And so the Santa Clara County story is one of the uh, Valley Homeless Healthcare Program, which I'm uh, gonna share a little bit about uh, now. So the Valley Homeless Healthcare Program is a part of Valley Medical Center. It's been around for almost 20 years. Uh, both myself and your uh, Larry Kwan, as well as another of amazing um, homeless healthcare team with that, uh, were some of the original founders of this organization. It's a ragtag group of very mission-minded individuals. Uh, and I'll share a story um, as far as relates to protecting our most vulnerable neighbors in this time of crisis. So in terms of expansion, a, a few weeks before the shelter in place went into effect, um, our homeless collaborative community, which includes partners outside of the homeless healthcare arena, started looking at our homeless shelters and knew that we were, you know, rife in terms of uh, places of high transmission about to happen. So we early on uh, began to make recommendations with others uh, to thin out the shelters 
or to reduce density, so to speak. Um, and so to that end, our, our county, Santa Clara County, opened up a number of new congregate sites, literally within the span of weeks, um, about 300 new beds. Uh, and we used a, a bunch of sites that uh, were no longer being used because of the pandemic. So some of the sites included a large hall in uh, the San Jose Convention Center, a pavilion at the Santa Clara County um, Fairgrounds, some community centers. Uh, and so these were some examples of uh, new congregate sites that came online. Uh, so each bed, uh, as you can see in these pictures, you know, they were spread out uh, six feet apart. Um, other kind of mitigation measures that were put into place um, were obviously uh, symptom screening, but also the popula the shelter, um, uh, the shelters also tried to minimize uh, the number of sort of the rate of folks coming into the shelter. So they really tried to stabilize the shelter populations. Uh, in addition, um, people were meant or asked to stay on the shelter grounds and step outside for a few hours while deep cleaning was uh, taken care of every day. But unless folks had essential business or work, people were asked to stay around the shelter premises. Another significant expansion that happened um, during this time was of our medical respite center. Uh, for, and for those that have not heard of it, it is a safe place uh, for persons that are experiencing homelessness to heal uh, after hospital discharge. Um, and historically, since 2008, our medical respite center has uh, been located in San Jose's largest homeless shelter. But at the time of the COVID pandemic, uh, the medical respite center was moved to a local area hotel. And at that time, our medical respite center capacity doubled in its capacity as well. Uh, we, uh, another strategy used was mitigation. Uh, so at a number of the encampments across the county, we worked together uh, with the county and other governmental agencies to suspend encampment abatements. Uh, so this means we stopped all sweeps of our encampments with the thought that uh, the sweeps can kind of be a chaotic, chaotic period, which could put people at more risk for COVID. Um, hygiene equipment was placed uh, at all the different large encampment areas. Uh, so as you can see, kind of hand-washing stations and portable toilets, uh, these were quickly put into place uh, with the partnership with the city of San Jose um, at a number of these large encampment sites, uh, and as well as regu regular garbage collection was uh, started as well, um, and provisions for clean water. Uh, of course, testing was one of the mainstays uh, of our efforts. Um, so in May, we began monthly mass screening at all of our congregate sites and encampments greater than 10 individuals. Uh, you know, to be honest, we would have loved to have or would love to still screen more frequently than that. But unfortunately, monthly is kind of where we've been able to be at capacity wise. We've done about 2000 tests since May um, and about 50% of our patients approximately at any given time choose to test 50% uh, closer um, in the shelter population and a little bit closer to 40% in the encampment population. And you can see pictures of our team here conducting the mass testing. Um, I have to say that uh, kind of different than the morbidity and mortality weekly reports, uh, we've only actually had a number of clusters of positive cases uh, at each of these sites with no more than four at a time uh, in, at, at a time. And so what happens is at the time of a detection of a positive test, we quickly uh, place uh, the COVID positive individual into one of our motels that's designated for people uh, with the, the COVID-19. Um, COVID uh, and then we quickly test uh, the entire site. And then we return another seven days later to, uh, you know, until and every seven, every, repeating every seven days um, until, you know, everybody is negative. And I have to say, again, we've been super surprised that we've only had small clusters that have happened. Uh, and I have to say that, um, you know, I would love to say that this was because of a lot of the measures that we've put into place. But uh, to be honest, I, I don't think we have the full picture. If I observe kind of the social behaviors of, um, you know, the, the folks experiencing homelessness, you know, we are often experiencing and watching people not fully um, wear the mask appropriately covering nose and mouth, uh, and people congregating and talking. Um, and so it's to be honest, a mystery to us um, as to you know why we haven't seen that level of outbreak. I'm going to knock on wood and let's hope that that continues to be the case. I think um, the most press and publicity efforts have been around our efforts to provide isolation and quarantine to shield those 
uh, that are experiencing homelessness from COVID. So on April 3rd, the California Governor Gavin Newsom announced the launch of Project Room Key, which is an initiative to isolate and shelter certain, certain individuals experiencing homelessness uh, amid the COVID-19 emergency. California was the first state in our nation uh, to secure FEMA approval to procure hotels and motels for these high-risk individuals. Uh, and the counties, so the FEMA will pay about 75% uh, of the funding for these motels. Um, and the county, through a number of other kind of sources, needs to pay and kind of find the other 25% to pay. Um, and so as you can imagine, this is a, a Herculean effort of bringing up uh, these individual contracts, um, you know, kind of up and running uh, within a matter of weeks, uh, as long as, as well as with property management provision for uh, meal three times a day, uh, laundry and security at each site. Um, and I have to say uh, that not every community has had the privilege to house folks in motels. Um, you know, I know in the early days, Boston had to use a sophisticated set of tents, um, you know, that actually could even achieve negative pressure um, and had their individual toilets. Uh, but I think that we've been really fortunate to bring the number of motels that we have uh, in the short period of time that we've had. Um, and so you can see from this timeline graph, we literally started our motel programs uh, in the middle of March, literally the day the shelter in place order uh, started. I think Seattle King County was about two weeks ahead of us, um, but literally we were one of the first communities uh, to begin sheltering homeless individuals in this way. And so for us, obviously this conversation had to start pretty early on. And so um, early in February, our program along with other homeless advocates across the county, uh, different organizations really rallied and advocated for quarantining uh, medically vulnerable individuals who were experiencing homelessness. You know, in reviewing my email trails for this talk, I literally found an email dated March 16th stating, give us your lists of vulnerable people today and we will place them today. Um, and so as you know, what we did was we reviewed all of our clinical, um, you know, VHHP reviewed all of our clinical patient lists. We reviewed them by age and number of medical conditions. And then in that same week, we uh, tapped our medical informatics partners and started to cut the data through Epic, uh, where we were able to slice and dice all of the larger VMC population for um, people experiencing homelessness who met these criteria as well. And so kind of in looking at all of our data, we ended up setting this criteria of vulnerability uh, and kind of looking at the projections of number of motel rooms that we, we thought that we could bring online. And we concluded upon the age criteria of age 65 as an absolute criteria and, uh, and or the age greater than 60 with three or more qualifying medical conditions. Uh, those conditions included cardiovascular disease, chronic lung disease, diabetes, cancer, and stage renal disease and cirrhosis. And we had uh, made the decision that HIV, cancer, and pregnancy would be absolute qualifiers uh, for a motel stay. Um, we couldn't do it at more two or more conditions as we didn't think that we had the number of motel rooms to, to sort of be able to reach that set point. And while we got to the absolute number of over 700 people in motel rooms, I have to tell you that it still felt like healthcare rationing to me uh, when I have to look at a client or patient in the eye and tell them that they did not meet criteria by age or by medical condition. Uh, it literally broke me every time and continues to break me uh, because as we all well know, uh, the risk levels are on a continuum and we cannot guarantee that um, people will not uh, get COVID-19 and we know for sure that these individuals that didn't meet the criteria that we had are not at significant risk. Uh, and so while we celebrate the wins of these 700 plus people that are in motels, we remain absolutely shaken at the number that we were not able to provide motels for. Um, and so as you can see, you know, our total numbers of folks that we've been able to reach have reached around 2000. Uh, that includes both motel as well as uh, congregate shelter situations. Um, we've also uh, gotten into the business of providing services for our um, for isolation as well for the COVID positive motel. Um, and so we have one motel that's uh, strictly dedicated for those that are COVID positive who cannot isolate. Turns out that the majority of the folks in that motel are actually not homeless. I would say only about 20 to 30 percent, um, you know, are experiencing homelessness, whereas the other 70 percent are those that live in very dense housing situations that don't have an opportunity to isolate in their living uh, conditions. Perhaps those that live in, um, you know, in housing situations where 11 to 20 people are under one roof. 
Um, and so, you know, the county is now bringing online because of our surge, uh, the second motel uh, in, in this week or the next week. So we had to literally um, pivot our medical services on a dime within weeks um, to, to really meet the needs of um, this vulnerable community. And so what we, we decided to do was to switch to a telehealth platform um, to manage uh, the number of patients that were going into motels and congregate settings. And I have to say that this is easier said than done uh, because, to be honest, most of our patients do not <clears throat> own a smartphone. Um, and many of them have pay-as-you-go plans, and so depending on the time of the month, we may or may not be able to reach people uh, through their cell phones. Uh, and so the age-old landline through the motels uh, was literally our lifeline to reach uh, a number of these individuals. Um, we provided, uh, you know, pharmacy, you know, so we, you know, worked with our pharmacy partners to provide contactless delivery to all of um, our sites at the congregate sites, as well as the motel sites, um, and as our kind of catchment area became larger, we're now focusing that kind of delivery to just mostly on the COVID positive motel. As you can imagine, our mental health and social work partners uh, have had to come online and really uh, meet the demands of mental health exacerbations that are that were happening in our in this community. And for those that we were not able to reach through the telehealth platform, uh, we've been able to reach through our medical mobile unit, as you can see here, uh, one that's parked. Um, and so our medical moment unit would go uh, from the frequency of uh, once a week to every month to every single one of our uh, different sites that just came online in the past few months. For issues that uh, needed more acute attention uh, that didn't meet the schedule of the mobile unit, we would send out our street medicine team, which normally goes to different encampments across the county. Uh, we would send them to, to see people in motels uh, that had acute issues coming up. As you can imagine, we had unique clinical situations come up. Um, you know, Josh will talk more about these, but in the area of addiction medicine, um, you know, we've had a number of folks, um, you know, the recoveries um, have been compromised, uh, resulting in uh, some morbidity and mortality, sadly. Um, and as well, we've also had some great stories of folks who have started on treatment for the first time, uh, namely a number of folks starting on buprenorphine for uh, treatment of opioid use disorder. Uh, we've had to kind of also interface with issues around incontinence uh, or lice or bed bugs uh, in some of the folks that uh, we've been seeing. And, and of course, our biggest worry has been, you know, how do we identify altered mental status? You know, what happens behind the closed door of a motel room when we can't see someone? And so these are some of the clinical issues that we've had uniquely had to come to face. I can't stress enough the importance of collaboration uh, in this juncture. Um, you know, quickly early on in, in February, March timeframe, uh, we started what's called the Joint Departmental Operations Center, which is actually known as JDOC, which is a collaboration between the Office of Supportive Housing, Valley Homeless Healthcare Program, City of San Jose, and Destination Home. So Office of Supportive Housing uh, is a county organization whose mission is to increase the supply of housing uh, in the extremely low income community. Destination Home is an NGO that's a public private partnership whose purpose is to provide high level strategies to end homelessness in our counties. Um, and you know, we've also partnered with uh, Garter Family Health Network, Peninsula Healthcare Connections, uh, and really this team uh, that sort of an operations center really is taking a look day by day, uh, putting all these plans into action. Um, I have to say that, you know, to back with this collaboration that this doesn't happen overnight. You know, we've been working with these partners for about eight to 10 years. And really this kind of came about when, um, you know, we've started to house people together. Uh, I think back in, I don't know, eight years ago with the Housing 1000 initiative. Um, you know, and so all of this, while this has been a great initiative uh, to, to meet the demands of really what's happening, um, with our homeless neighbors, uh, really it begs the question, what's going to happen in the long term? Um, and I'm glad to say that we've housed permanently over 400 folks uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. And this is actually not a special effort um, specifically for the pandemic, but this is what's been happening uh, in our county since about 2016 when we, um, as voters, passed an affordable housing bond uh, that passed $950 million, uh, to provide uh, affordable housing um, money uh, for kind of new or improved uh, permanent housing development. So 27 have come online since 2016. We're looking at hopefully a total of a 100 and that people have been continued to be housed uh, throughout the pandemic. A number of communities have increased safe parks for vehicles. Um, so 24 hour places um, for folks to park their RVs or cars. So city of San Jose and city of Mountain View 
are two notable examples of local communities. And I understand that in the next couple of months, Palo Alto will, bring their, will be bringing their first safe park uh, online soon. Um, as well, bless their hearts, City of San Jose um, has brought on uh, interim housing uh, and bridge housing. So they are, uh, as we speak, bringing on 300 interim housing units um, that are sort of these prefab units that get placed. So 200 for single adults, 100 for families. Uh, so once these prefab units are placed, uh, then the infrastructure comes in, such as sewer and utilities. And so a number of lessons learned. Um, you know, as I knew cognitively, we have a number of medically frail homeless individuals uh, in our county, but seeing them, uh, you know, kind of being housed in these motel settings as well as the congregate settings, you know, we're seeing folks um, that honestly, just on an emotional level, I, I just feel that we cannot let go. Um, you know, you have the elderly woman in a North County motel who wears a lace nightgown every night. So we, you know, procured a lace nightgown for her. Um, you know, we have the homeless individual who, you know, used to ride the bus 22, which is the bus that goes up and down the El Camino. That was his place of residence for a number of years. And we struggled with his lower extremity edema and suddenly being in a motel, uh, that's resolved. And, you know, he's able to walk around and ambulate quite well. You know, the other patients are, you know, the patient who, um, elderly gentleman who is receiving chemotherapy from Stanford, uh, who I can't imagine uh, would have had to do this uh, perhaps from his encampment. Uh, and so really, as I had said, uh, this stresses the necessity of this village to really come around these individuals uh, in these coming days. Uh, I think, uh, you know, and Josh is gonna speak to this well, there's a lot that we don't know about COVID transmission. The fact that we haven't had a major outbreak is to be honest, completely shocking. Um, and so I think there's much more to learn um, about who is vulnerable and who is not uh, in this pandemic. And I think for me, the final take home point, take home point is that we can actually house people. Um, you know, I, I, one of my favorite heroes, uh, you know, in this work is the CEO of Destination Home, Jennifer Loving. Uh, and she has always talked about that as, uh, you know, the United States, we have the resources that it takes to house every single homeless individual uh, in our communities. Uh, but we just don't have the will and we lack the will. And when we saw that literally 2000 people were placed in some sort of shelter in literally uh, the span of weeks to months, I um, was reminded that she is absolutely right. Uh, that many times, you know, at, to be honest, we actually don't have the will and we actually can house people. And with that, I'm gonna turn this over to, to Josh uh, for the next set. Thanks so much and good morning. Uh, Tali, if you could put up my slides for me. Uh, from the foot of Mount Katahdin here at the Big Moose Inn in Maine is where I am speaking. And uh, it's nice to uh, have this opportunity. Um, I want to give a shout out to uh, Dr. Chang and uh, also to Dr. Verghese. Uh, Dr. Verghese, you and I were on a panel about 1998, I believe, at uh, George Mason University when I was doing HIV post-exposure prophylaxis stuff. And it's wonderful to be around. And Song was my R2. Um, back at that family medicine uh, residency at San Francisco General. It's wonderful to see a friendly face. Um, so next slide, please. So as Cheryl said, um, you know, we expected a huge a flood of COVID infection among the homeless population with an incredible mortality rate. And this uh, is just taken from an article written by Dennis Colhane, who is sort of the father of homeless research in this country. And we expected that about 20% of the homeless population was going to be infected and uh, about a fourth of those were going to die. Uh, and that initiated, uh, next slide, really a, a call to action. So from my, my experience, I hope you can hear me. Next slide. Um, can you hear me? Can yes, you hear me? We, yeah, there you go. We okay. hear you well. Thank you. Um, okay, great. Sorry about that. Uh, previous slide, please. Um, so for me, um, I had taken a pilgrimage with UCSF leadership uh, to rural Alabama to, to uh, understand better the sources and the ideology of racism in African Americans and went with a bunch of amazing leaders, uh, deans, uh, vice chancellors and so on. And we returned uh, on March 5th on that day and while sitting in the waiting room, one of the deans mentioned that his sister had taken a flight from uh, Oakland to Spokane and uh, managed to become infected with this new respiratory infection. And you know, up until that time, we really thought that this was predominantly people who were gonna be exposed to folks who uh, are from China. And this was a completely you know, different experience. And that created for me 
a call to action. So I have been in a research institution called the UCSF Benioff Homelessness and Housing Initiative. And I pretty much decided that this as a research time was not what I wanted to prioritize my work on. I called Kevin Grumbach, who is the chair, if I could just launch into providing direct care in the shelters. And so starting March 12th and pretty much nonstop since then until I came here to Maine, uh, I've been in the shelters trying to find people who've been exposed to this virus and finding, the sim finding them symptomatically so we could get them out of the congregate shelter setting. And remarkably from March 12th until our first case uh, on April 1st, next slide, we, we had almost no um, cases. We had no people who were febrile, we had no one who was, had, had a new cough, no one who had any symptoms, and it was not at all what we expected. Uh, we expected this huge wave and instead there were almost no cases despite going around and sitting with people at the bedside, cheek to jowl at shelters, uh, and no one seemed to be getting sick. And it just was hard to understand. Uh, in contrast, on April 1st at one of our shelters, the Division uh, Circle Navigation Center, we had our first positive case. And unfortunately, we did not test everyone in the shelter to find out how uh, widespread the infection was at that time. We moved that individual and the two people who were sleeping next to them to our newly uh, stood up isolation and quarantine units. And then uh, a few days later, we had this big outbreak. Now, uh, MSC South, which is a shelter in San Francisco, is the largest congregate shelter in the city. It houses at its peak about 370 people. Um, at the time, it was only about uh, 200 folks because we had done some, um, some thinning out of the population. And we had the first couple cases that came up on the, uh, April 4th. And then on April 6th, I was in the shelter screening everyone with our newly purchased digital th uh, thermal, thermal, thermal digital uh, thermometers. Uh, uh, for anyone who might have an increased temperature, I screened 171 people on that Monday and not a single person had, uh, had a fever. By Wednesday, two thirds of the population had tested positive and 15% uh, and of the staff all of whom didn't have good access to PPE. So what happened at that shelter continues to be a great mystery because as Cheryl knows, homeless people do not just stay in a shelter all day long like they would in a nursing home. They're out and about doing, their, doing work, uh, selling drugs, buying drugs, getting food, waiting in soup lines, all sorts of things. And yet we have no idea how widespread that outbreak that had two thirds of the population uh, infected because we didn't do any uh, community-wide screening at that time. In fact, we didn't screen as Cheryl has done so wonderfully in Santa Clara. We didn't screen people uh, in, um, for another month. So it's possible that homeless people in San Francisco had a huge infection rate at that time that we just missed. And since we haven't done any antibody tests, we don't really know if they are now infected, but not, um, uh, but not uh, we weren't able to pick it up with a, with a PCR test. Um, so then we started, thankfully, to move people out of shelters and into these um, tourist hotels. And right now we have about uh, 23 hotels and uh, 2,400 people who are in these tourist hotels. And I'm supervising the medical staff who are providing care for these folks. Um, next slide, please. So what did we learn from this first push? which was not very well organized. We had to purchase our own cell phones. We had to purchase our own thermometers and so on. What did we learn? Well, it was good enough because there wasn't, as Cheryl mentioned, a huge outbreak of COVID among the homeless as we expected. And yet we still don't really know the prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 in the homeless since we haven't done a universal antibody study. And it's possible though we're now doing much more aggressive PCR testing uh, with very few people testing positive, it's possible that many people were previously infected and now uh, somewhat resistant to become infected with acute infections. Most of the transmission was asymptomatic, as I mentioned. We screened everyone for symptoms, and yet a huge number of people ended up testing positive in that one shelter. And thankfully, homeless people aren't getting particularly sick. So even if the folks who were symptomatic, there weren't a lot of admissions to the hospital, and there were very few people in the ICU and almost no deaths. However, by moving everyone into do indoors and getting eyeballs on these folks who have been on the streets for years and years, we've seen a huge problem of chronic medical conditions that have not been treated. And so many people have out of control HIV, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, et cetera. And next slide, this has resulted 
in with this disruption that has happened because of COVID and a huge increase in deaths among the homeless population in San Francisco. And this slide shows an increase overall between March, April, and May. And the next slide, you can see just looking at quartiles that the number of people who've died uh, since uh, COVID hit the homeless population in April has increased dramatically. Next slide, please. So what, do, what can we do? Next slide, please. So what, so what has been the result is you know, a huge disruption in the homeostasis among the homeless population in San Francisco and in this country with large numbers of people, next slide, not being able to get into shelter. So we have all these folks who are now having to sleep on the streets who weren't there before with an enormous increase in people living in tents. Um, and we are stuck now in a situation we've had moved finally people indoors to these tourist hotels and similarly in San Francisco, mostly people who are vulnerable or older. But what are we going to do now? Because this can't continue for much longer. So I just want to briefly end with a couple of take home points and call to action for the Stanford community. First of all, what I'd like to say is we have many people who are in tourist hotels who could stay there and live their life there. Um, but to do so, this hotel needs to be purchased and not flipped back to a tourist hotel. So as many uh, large universities have been trying to work out, how, what's the responsibility of a university to provide ongoing support for the community through this anchor institution idea? The simplest thing is you know, to buy locally, to make sure that you're purchasing um, hospital supplies from a local area, ideally focusing on uh, minority underserved communities. But there's a huge endowment that UCSF and Stanford has. And the opportunity to use that money, which is sitting in a bank, making two or 3% interest, and to purchase two or three of these tourist hotels so that we could then continue to use the wonderful skills that Jennifer Loving and others at Destination have at home have to be able to have provide ongoing permanent housing for this population, which we have discovered as being so vulnerable and are now having a, such an increased death rate compared to the past. Secondly, we have this enormous understanding now of the medical complications of people who've been living on the streets, and it's our responsibility to provide them with ongoing primary care. So what can, what can Stanford's diverse clinical setting do to provide more access to primary care through leadership like Dr. Chang and others who can say, how can Stanford provide this care directly? How can we take off some of the incredible burden that Cheryl Ho and her team are having to live with to serve this needy population? Can you take some of that on? And then thirdly, we have an opportunity to learn in new ways to do substance abuse treatment. So alcohol management, more Suboxone or buprenorphine out there. Maybe we need to have a safe consumption facility so we can keep people alive. Half of the new death of the death increase in San Francisco is due to opiate overdose, and this is 100% preventable with both suboxone, naloxone, which uh, reverses overdoses, and then also getting people into a place where they can inject or use safely under the eyes of medical folks so they don't die. And lastly, we can't return to where we were pre-COVID. We have we know clearly that we can house everybody if we have the will and to send people from these tourist hotels back to the streets would be one of the greatest shames i think of our history in this country we just cannot do that so i call on all of us to not let us slide back to where we were to use our resources both financial and medical to provide the care that we desperately need for this population that has been so greatly impacted by covid not so much because of infection but because of the disruption that has happened and i'll stop there and hopefully we can have some questions Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Baumberger. Thank you, Dr. Ho. Um, again, thank you for joining us today. You know, there's there's one uh, question. There's a few questions here that I'll kind of I'm going to combine into one question. They all they're all surrounding the surprise in less rates of infected uh, that was expected, and the questions about the theory of why that is. Uh, Dr. Singh, Dr. Spiegel ask, uh, could this be related to high sunlight exposure, vitamin D levels? I actually had a question I was going to ask, and Dr. Shaw asked this, could it be simply because uh, these homeless are uh, more likely to get coronavirus infections? There's an article that came out recently that it, you could be protected if you've been exposed to previous coronaviruses, the ones that have been around circling for a long time. Any thoughts to that? What's the mechanism of the surprise? 
Well, for me, I just want to embrace the humility of this uh, virus. This, uh, we just don't know. And to, to sort of spitball ideas, I think would really do a disservice to the science. I'm really looking forward to the time when we can look back and understand this. But I think the most important thing is not to sort of, uh, to recognize the heterogeneity, heterogeneity of the homeless population. I don't think there's anything specifically uh, stronger or weaker or more vulnerable or less, you know, so many people that we know are, are homeless have only been homeless recently with a huge increase, particularly among the seniors, you know, people over the age of 50 who are homeless, half of them did not become homeless until they were over the age of 50. So I, I just don't think there's any, you know, way to differentiate biologically homeless people from other populations that would perhaps explain their resistance, if you will, to being exposed. I just don't think we know. Gotcha. Yeah, and I would agree. I mean, I think that the story is not done. I mean, you know, we are starting to see spikes in a number of um, uh, different other communities. And, uh, you know, so I, I think the story is still yet to be told. Gotcha. Um, Elizabeth Litchie asks, as the supplemental aid programs, the end of the $600 uh, from the government uh, ends, is there a plan to address people at the risk of losing housing? Sure, I mean, I think there's lots of efforts. Uh, Keep Oakland Housed is a really uh, innovative program that tries to prevent uh, homelessness. But I think you also have to recognize that people who are going to lose financial support are not necessarily gonna become homeless. I wouldn't expect a big increase in homeless. And Cheryl, you may think differently. I expect there's gonna be a huge increase in people doubling up living in unsafe housing conditions, finding ways to avoid hitting the streets. But then a year later, when that social network that is supporting people who do have some resources start to crumble, that's when we're gonna get the next wave. So I think there's gonna be a little bit of delay in homelessness. And don't think that eviction necessarily leads to homelessness. Eviction can just lead to instability of housing where social networks can support people. Uh, so there's a lot, again, also to learn around prevention that we just are not knowing enough. And again, that's great why the, the, the Benioff Homelessness Initiative exists, is to understand some of those research questions that can help to drive policy. At the moment, we know what some things that do work, which is housing, 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 and we've got to keep the people who are presently housed, stably housed. Okay, great. Um, uh, Dr. Ho, you mentioned, uh, you actually answered one of these questions here, and I thought I might just ask you to mention um, out loud, uh, there was a question about uh, Berkeley, and you talked a little about um, the resources in Alameda. Do you mind commenting on that a little bit more, and any other thoughts you have about really the surrounding counties, if you have more information? I'm sure we'd all love to hear a little bit more about what's going on there. Yeah, so uh, during this pandemic time, uh, all the homeless healthcare communities in the Bay Area started banding together on kind of several uh, bi-weekly calls through the organization called Home Base. And so we've been sharing best practices um, and, you know, kind of, uh, you know, ideas across the board. And so Alameda, San Francisco, and Santa Clara counties, I think, um, have been have some of the most robust responses. And so I think the question was asked about Berkeley. I think, unfortunately, you know, I think the person uh, who had asked the question was asking, you know, can we you know, house folks in the encampments and what can be offered. And unfortunately, you know, we're not able to house everyone, but I do think that uh, many of the counties are really doing an impressive job. And from what I understand, you know, across the country, different communities like this have popped up for those that are um, really trying to shelter and protect our most vulnerable neighbors. Gotcha. Okay, great. Um, guys, I think that we'll end it there. Uh, Oh, actually, I'm sorry. One other question came through from Ben uh, through the chat here. Dr. Pinsky, um, in charge of our labs, he he um, he and our co his colleagues have uh, talked to us a lot about the work that we'll be doing on pooled PCR testing. Have you guys looked at potentially doing that to do more mass testing? We've talked about it, but um, yeah, but we. I mean, I think nothing's set in stone, but we've definitely been throwing that around. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Ho, Dr. Bomberger, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. And uh, most importantly, thank you for the work that you do. Um, uh, there's been, of course, lots of comments I've gotten uh, here and, and, and through email about um, the amazing uh, work you do. You guys are clearly um, uh, passionate about what you do. And thank you for being such amazing clinicians and caring for the underserved. Thank you for being with us again today. I hope everybody has a great week. Uh, our panelists, thank you for being with us. And for our attendees, thank you for joining. Thank you so much. Have a good day.